OK, hello, everyone. I am Matthew Meyer, the Canadian Operations Officer of North American Young Generation Nuclear, and I'm joined by Doug Lightfoot, the director and producer of Nobody's Fuel, which is on YouTube. And uh, yeah, just had some questions about this awesome film and uh, I'm honored to be joined by you today, uh, Doug. So uh, without further ado, uh, how can people find the film Nobody's Fuel? Any uh, any references or uh, any website they'd like them to go to? Yeah, 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 yes. Uh, uh, pe pe people can see the film at Nobody's Fuel. It's on YouTube. Nobody's Fuel.com on YouTube. Yeah. And okay. they can see the whole film there. Perfect. And they can see that for free as well. Uh, so I want to kick it off by uh, what type of engineering did you take and what brought you to nuclear? Okay, I, I graduated from the University of British Columbia in 1952 in applied science and mechanical and mechanical engineering. And uh, during my career, at, uh, I joined Domtar after that. And during my career of 18 years at Domtar, I learned a lot about energy. Uh, Domtar was making asphalt shingles at that time. And we continually got suggestions that we should be making photovoltaic shingles. And all of these things ended up on my desk. Uh, I had uh, I had obtained an MBA from Concordia in 1976. And so uh, everybody at the research center thought I was the best guy to deal with these. <laughs> so I got all kinds of them to, 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 to look at. And uh, uh, and, and, and I retired in 1989, and in 1992 joined uh, the McGill Center for Climate and Global Change Research. Uh, I wrote several papers there with a co-author, and uh, I was active there uh, for 23 years uh, as, as an associate member. Uh, about 2004, I began to realize there was lots of misinformation about energy out there. So uh, with my son, Brian, we wrote a DVD called Nobody's Fuel. Uh, it's uh, two, uh, over two hours long, but it's a, it's a comprehensive view of the world's energy system. And uh, it shows how, how, uh, how important fossil fuels are to us, how many we use, and uh, what we have to do if we're going to continue to have the kind of energy we need to support the well-being that we now have. Wow, it sounds like a full journey, and especially interesting to hear that uh, they were talking about shingles that had photovoltaic properties uh, way back then especially during the uh, the oil crisis, I imagine that uh, became more uh, more of a priority and uh, more of a focus. Yeah, it, it's uh, uh, fossil uh, photovoltaic shingles can be made, but then then uh, you still have to be collected to connected to the grid because sometimes you don't get electricity from from these things and uh, and then people want to be able to sell sell uh, energy back to the grid, and so the the grid has got to look after these this very fluctuating uh, source of source of electricity, and it becomes very difficult. And, and, and I think I think we're seeing that as well in Germany with the rolling blackouts, with the increased uh, grid complications. When you have all these individuals that are now connected to the grid and that are producing power all at once, we see it really complicates the grid as well. So that's, that's a really interesting perspective. It, it really complicates the grid. And, and, and since they only take electricity sometimes, they, they only pay for part of the maintenance. So some, some, in some places, they're being charged a connection charge to pay for the maintenance of the grid so that it's always there when they need it. Wow. So how have you seen the public perception change in terms of energy over the years? So you've had a broad experience, uh, especially getting involved in alternative energy. So how have you seen the, the change in perception over the years? Well, 
Well, I, I, I've seen it change from, uh, you know, it's fossil fuels that have brought us the, the immense wealth we, wealth we have today. We're the wealthiest uh, society in the world has ever seen. And it's because of the energy and fossil fuels. And now people are saying, oh, we don't need fossil fuels. We can turn off the oil tap. And fossil fuels have been demonized because of CO2. And, 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 uh, and the advantages of, of fossil fuels have just been thrown under the carpet. Uh, and, and that's bad because if we curtail the use of fossil fuels, we'll become poor again. It's just that simple. But that's not realized by many people. The scare that CO2 will cause climate change has been widely promoted. Uh, and it's not certain. It's not certain at all. You can find all kinds of people who are saying it doesn't work. In fact, I've written some papers about that too, but uh, they don't they don't cut much. So, so that's what I've seen. Uh, uh, CO2 is being demonized, and so fossil fuels are being demonized, and uh, uh, and, and uh, it just doesn't work that way. And I think you brought some really good points in your film about how it takes 2,500 kilometers for uh, food to reach the supermarket to your kitchen, and how much fuel and fossil fuels are required to actually produce tires to produce. TVs to produce the cardboard boxes, and I, I absolutely agree with you that we're we're demonizing this, and we're focusing on just the electricity sector, and that's really where all the focus has been with renewables. It's just the electricity sector, which just just a portion of the uh, of the energy required. It doesn't talk about transportation, and then, as you point out in the film, it's really you know, people are trying to reduce what they're using, but then they'll t still take international flights. So I, I thought that was a really interesting point as well. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, one thing that people don't understand is that all energies are not created equal. Oil is by far the most valuable of the, of the energy sources because it's the most versatile. You can generate electricity with it, you can fly airplanes with it, you can drive cars with it, you can make plastics out of it, you can do all kinds of things. But wind, for example, it generates electricity and only sometimes. So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very weak, so solar is very weak as well. Uh, coal is, very, is, is a very strong fossil fuel. It generates most of the world's electricity. It's a solid fuel, so it's difficult to handle. Uh, oil is liquid fuel, which is very easy, easy to measure, easier to control. That's why we, well, it has so many very good uses. And it's really interesting as a society, we've kind of gone towards the more energy dense sources. We started out with firewood, we went to whale fat, we went to coal, we went to oil, all in terms of increasing energy density. Then we went to nuclear, which is now splitting the nuclear force, which is much more powerful or much more energy dense. And then we seem to take a shift back into wind and solar, which are much less energy dense, which is really interesting to see through society. Yes, you made some, uh, you made some, some uh, very good points. That's right. Energy, uh, we've gone to more and more dense energy all the time. And, and, and uh, uh, one of the reasons I like nuclear is because it's so energy dense. Uh, with uranium, we have enough fuel if we use fast breeder reactors to last for tens of thousands of years. And, and after that, then we've got thorium. Now, I know people are promoting thorium right now, but but uh, the waste, the waste or the waste or the, this, the unspent fuel from our present reactors is uranium-238. Now, we can't use that directly. We have to convert it to plutonium-239 and then it's a, a good fuel like you, as good as U-235. U it's also good bomb making material, but it's high energy density. 
Thorium by itself is not of much use, but we, if it's converted to uranium-233, which is another good bomb-making material, it, 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 it's fissile and, and can uh, produce lots of heat energy. And so some people are working on thorium, but uh, I like upon thorium as a uh, second-rate uh, uh, radioactive material that we can use when we run out of uranium. Remember, there's 4.4 billion tons of uranium in the oceans, and we know how to get that out of there. And I think you made really good reference to that in the film as well, as people thought there was going to be an oil shortage, but as soon as the price started to go up, then people started to get more innovative in finding the the, uh, the fields as well. So the same can be done with uranium. We just know about a certain extent, but if the price goes up, if the demand goes up, more people will try and find the reserves of that as well. Uh, you, you made a very good point. That's exactly right. I talked to a, ge a geologist once who, was, who had been in prospecting for uranium. And I and I asked him, I said, suppose the, suppose the price of uranium were to double. And he said, 10 times more would be instantly available. A, 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 and you can afford, and, and uh, it is so energy dense, we can afford to spend $8,000 a pound for the stuff. You know, and, and, and at that price, you'll be digging it out of your backyard. Well, and that's the thing, too, is with all the spent fuel we have, that is just a future resource that we can use. There's still so much raw energy in there, and we haven't even talked about fusion research yet. We haven't even talked about all these other sources. Um, I, I just, I see such potential there. Yeah, I, 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 I don't talk much about fusion. Uh, fusion is always 20 years or 50 years away. It's a long way off. In fact, uh, uh, I wrote a paper uh, titled uh, uh, Nuclear Fission Fuel is Inexhaustible in about 2006. And I had four nuclear guys as co-authors. One of those, uh, Wally Mannheimer, uh, is a fusion expert guy. And he says he thinks that, that the, the people doing fusion have overlooked some serious problems that he's not sure if they'll be able to solve. So I'm not sure how long fusion is going to be before it gets here. And it's not going to be small as far as we can tell. Fusion to the nuclear industry is batteries to the renewables. It's always just out of the reach. It's always the promise. That's, that's what I relate it to for the renewable industry as well. Yeah, and, and nuclear fission fuel is here right now. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. And really that brings me to my next question is, how can young professionals make a difference in climate change? Like my generation didn't grow up with the stigma of nuclear weapons. And I think our generation is more willing to look towards alternatives such as nuclear if it can fight climate change. So how can we do that? Uh, young people need to pay attention and question the science. It, it is not at all certain that carbon dioxide causes climate change. There's a group of people that are pushing it and are very arrogant and get upset if anybody says, hey, maybe you guys might be wrong if you consider this. They just brush it off. So pay attention to the science. That's very important. And, and, at, and at some point, uh, all of this stuff will settle out. But uh, there is uh, something that's not very well known is there's very good evidence that the sun controls the Earth's temperature. Now, there, uh, NASA has an article on their website uh, by a, that titled, Lack of Sunspots to Bring Record Coal, Cold Warns NASA Scientist. In other words, the number of sunspots have got so low that we're, we're maybe going to experience another maunder minimum. And that's when the Earth was so cold in the 16th and 17th hundreds that the Thames River froze over in England. And it looks like we might be headed that way right now. And so, so lack of sunspots to bring record cold warns NASA scientists. Find that on the NASA website and read it. It's very interesting. 
And I think you brought up a good point is the whole point of science is to question things, is to have doubts. And I think this is what we've seen recently is there's just a blind faith in renewables. There's just there's almost a taboo to question anything out there. And regardless of what people think, I, I think it's always good to have a healthy skepticism to research yourself. But we can definitely agree that fossil fuels produce pollution and pollution is killing people. So maybe I should rephrase it as how can young professionals make a difference to stop or slow down pollution in our planet? Yeah, and, and, and that's the key question. Don't get rid of the fossil fuels because they're what have provided the, our well-being, but get rid of the pollution. In, in the 1920s and 30s, this, the, the uh, smelter at Kitimat, uh, I mean, sorry, and Trail was producing uh, large volumes of exit gases which went down the river and killed all the trees. And, and uh, as people, but jobs were more important in those days. And as people got more jobs and, and got wealthier, they wouldn't accept that anymore. That had to be stopped and it was stopped. But the plant is still there producing the lead and zinc that we need. The same thing with fossil fuels. We need the energy from fossil fuels and we need to we need to reduce the pollution. And carbon dioxide is not pollution. Carbon dioxide is not pollution. Carbon dioxide is just as important to your life as air, water and sunlight. If there were no CO2, there'd be no plants and there'd be no food and there'd be no people. It's just that simple. And I think something that people overlook is that burning fossil fuels is burning everything involved in that ore or that coal. So it's not just burning coal, it's burning uranium as well. It's burning thorium. It's producing sulfur dioxide. It's producing nitrous dioxide. So that's something I think people sometimes overlook is how much radiation is actually released from the, uh, the fossil fuel burning and how much acid rain and all these other effects. And you mentioned that in your film as well. Yes, yes. And, and, and that stuff can all be treated and taken out of the stack gas. So it, 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 it can be done. I understand it. Uh, Taiwan has some very clean coal plants, but I, I don't know too much about them. But if somebody wants to look into that, there's a place to go. Yeah, that's that's a great thing is maybe that's how we change is we start to invest in scrubbers and cleaner technologies. It's not just making them the enemy. It's working together in the world to actually get results. So that's not demonizing fossil fuels. That's that's just working together to transition away to make them cleaner as well. Yes, and just another point, we've got this COVID-19 crisis right now. If we didn't have oil, we wouldn't be able to fight the COVID crisis. So just think about that for a while. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is so much of our products are used using fossil fuels. I think we just need to look at, as a world, the amount of energy required, where that energy is coming from, and the impact from each source as well. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the, the world uses a little over 600 exajoules of energy every year, and 80% uh, of that is from fossil fuels. So and that's the fact. So what are you, some of your experiences, some resources that made you a fan of nuclear? Because uh, in your film, as a not having a background in nuclear, what what brought you towards that uh, that uh, that desire that uh, that well, fan? When we wrote Nobody's Fuel, we looked at the total supply of energy, and and we, and we broke it all down by coal, oil, natural gas, and renewables, and all that sort of stuff. And when you looked at it, renewables were very small, maybe a, a seven or eight percent, and, and three quarters of that was hydro. And so, so why did I like nuclear? 
because it's here now. It's the safest way to make large quantities of electricity. Uh, and, and by that, I mean, uh, it's, uh, just let me, it, it's, um, I just have to find that here. It's the safest way to make it. It's, it's 10 times safer than natural gas, 20 times safer than coal, uh, 40 times safer than oil, 100 times safer than hydro. And so it's the safest way by far. And, and we've got enough fuel to last for tens of thousands of years. So it's for me, it's a no brainer. But we have to go to fossil fuels so we can use up the unit, your the uranium, the uranium 238. It, I really liked in the in the video in the film as well how you looked at the deaths from damming incidents, damming problems that they've had where dams have filled, killed tens or hundreds of thousands of people, and how you looked objectively at coal just through the deaths from mining as well. And I think that's really where nuclear comes as the winner, is since it uses so much less natural resources, it uses less mining. It, there's just so many benefits that when you compound that makes it so much safer than the alternatives when you look at it in the life cycle. And it has a very small footprint as well, too. And, and, uh, and, and it has an advantage over hydro in, in that uh, you can put the nuclear plants where you need the electricity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hydro is, is hundreds of miles from where you need it. And I think that's a key point sometimes people overlook is they see the impact of how much renewables produce for the world and they just scale it up. But as you said, to have a hydro station, you need to have that water source there. And if you've already had that water source, they've already largely tapped those like Niagara Falls. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's right. So what are some main misconceptions that you see out there. Why are people such fans of renewables, but not of nuclear? Why don't we have this young generation rallying for nuclear? Why do we have them so focused on renewables? Okay, well, uh, there, there are a couple of reasons for that is uh, people think, oh, I like the wind power. It's free and it's forever, but it's not free and it's not, <laughs> and, and it's only there once in a while. And, and you have to remember that the wind power lobbies in Europe and in North America have been very powerful. They, 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 they've, they've promoted wind, wind energy left, right and center. They've, they've gone into the government in the US. They've, they've, given, they've bought all the senators and all, the, all those people and they're all, all giving lots of money for, for wind. And that and that that happens everywhere. It happened in Europe too. So there's been a great lobby. It's because people think, oh, the wind. Oh, what a nice way to make power. It's free forever, and it doesn't hurt anything, except it kills all kinds of birds and bats and that kind of stuff. But uh, nobody pays attention to that. And I, I think you've hit on a key point there as well. Is people see it on a small scale but can't see the macro implications of that, of the, the land you'd need, of the transmission lines, of the ecological damage that you see from that, where they're so quick to judge nuclear for yes. us. Uh, and, and you talked about it in the fuel in the uh, video, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima as well. Yeah, there's been a very strong anti-nuclear uh, promotion in North America. Uh, be, there's been a real industry generating anti-nuclear promotion in North America. It's all over the place. And, and the first thing that people say is, oh, but the waste, the waste is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, going to be radioactive for 10,000 years. Well, that's in fact true, but there's so little of it it can be stopped by a thin layer of steel and concrete, okay? And and I've seen you can see these casks, and you can see people without without protection walking around them because there is no problem with them. 
there's so little amount of it. But that's ignored by the anti-nuclear group. And I think that's so true is people hear this word nuclear waste and they they don't know what it is. They, they think it might be this goo, but it's really just the fuel pellets that go in are the same fuel pellets that come out. And as you said, they're stored on site right now in casks. And I've walked around them as well. You can be on the outside of the cask and you could get more radiation from a flight than standing there for a year. But yeah, think, exactly right. You've got it perfectly. Yes, yes. People yes. are so afraid that they're driving our industry out of business with misconceptions. And I think one that you really struck on in the film is linear non-threshold, which... Yes. Which, do you want to talk a little bit about that some more? <laughs> Yeah, it, it's uh, it it was brought out by uh, uh, a guy named Muller, and uh, it it was a fraud. He he uh, he faked he faked his results, and this got accepted. And so uh, the the linear no threshold says uh, all radiation at every level is dangerous, and yet there actually is a threshold. The, you can actually. Radiation has a hormesis effect. A certain amount of radiation is good for you. Then it reaches a point where it's bad for you. But there is a threshold. And, and so uh, the linear no threshold. And there's a lot of work being done to get rid of that. And I think we're going to, we're slowly getting to the point where, where we're going to get rid of that and, and look at it possibly. You know, the, when Chernobyl happened, and the radiation got 1.6 millisieverts above the background level of six millisieverts, then everybody was evacuated. Now it was necessary to evacuate from very close to the reactor, but the rest of it wasn't necessary. And it's the reaction, it's the evacuation that hurt people. Now, the, the, right now, the evacuation level is 20 millisieverts. If it gets up to that, then you can evacuate people. But U.S. nuclear workers are allowed 50 millisieverts a year, okay? And and if you lived in Ramsar, Iran, you'd be living in 700 millisieverts all the time, and people in Ramsar are as healthy as you and I. So, and, so and that gives you some extent of how of how, how badly this stuff has been, been promoted. It's not, as, not nearly as dangerous as people say it is. I, I think so. that's a really good point as well, because when it started, it's using the uncertainty principle saying, okay, let's be precautious, let's err on the side of uh, precaution. But as you said, when people are forced to evacuate, when people are killing themselves because of the fear and the stigma related to that from Chernobyl and Fukushima, Daiichi evacuations and having abortions and we're setting the price so much higher based on this that's not based on science, then it does have implications. And if millions of people a year are dying from pollution, then it does have implications. It's not the uncertainty principle anymore, the, the do nothing option is actually yeah. causing harm. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, the uh, nobody nobody died from radiation at uh, Fukushima, and I think there were twenty eight people who died from radiation at Chernobyl, and these were the first responders who went in and tried to fix the situation. But uh, no, very. As I say, nuclear energy is the safest by far. And, 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 and no matter how you look at it. Uh, so anyways, that's, uh, it's, it, you've got me on my favorite subject and it is, and, and uh, I've done my best to try and promote nuclear energy. Energy is what gives us our well-being and our wealth today. And we've got to continue to have it, even when we we even when uh, fossil fuels become scarce. We've got to have lots of energy, 
Uh, nuclear fission energy generates electricity. We have to do as much as we can with electricity, but we can't do everything because it's not flexible enough. We have to save all of our oil and coal and natural gas to make liquid fuels for air, road and off-road transport. Now, off-road transport is for the farmer who grows your food. Now, and this is important stuff. This, this, this comes at the end of our Nobody's Fuel DVD. We had a, uh, an energy supply plan and that comes right out of our energy supply plan. And I think that's really where nuclear can play another role as well, is having the waste heat maybe split uh, water into hydrogen for fuel, or it could be these co-generating stations, or it could be a small nuclear reactor at a mining facility so that they're not having to burn what they're taking out of the ground to take more out of the ground so we get ahead in that way as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have to be careful. Uh, if we're going to make large quantities of hydrogen, it's not going to be by electrolysis because electrolysis can't be scaled because you can't just double double the uh, the current because that the, the, the resistance goes up as the square of the current, so you can't do that. So there's going to be some some kind of a thermal split, splitting program for make, for splitting water, and uh, those processes are scalable. In other words, you can build a twice as big a plant, but it won't cost twice as much. And that that'll eventually happen, but it'll be a long it's a long way off yet. We don't yeah. need all that hydrogen. In fact. Most of the hydrogen made today is made from natural gas. And, and, and the hydrogen that's used in ammonia to make ammonia fertilizers, so we have nitrogen fertilizers. And nitrogen fertilizers are the, are the critical element in, in, in food production. And, and we're, 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 we make all the hydrogen from natural gas. And now we're burning up the natural gas to generate electricity when we should be using nuclear. You know, it doesn't make any sense. As one engineer to another, it's it's all about looking at the numbers, looking what makes sense. And like you said, it's saving those resources for what we need, which is food. And it may be going towards vertical farming. It may be doing these other types of strategies. But like you said, it's 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 absurd not to look at nuclear when it's so clean, it's so efficient, it's so scalable. It's, it's crazy. It's a no-brainer. <laughs> you, you just look at the capacity factor and it's and the energy density. If you look at those two together, it's, yes. it, from an engineering cursory glance, it, it just is leaps and bounds above others. So that's why I definitely got in front of it. That's right. Yeah. So what was your experience like during the filming process? And what has the reaction been since you've uh, released it? It was a good experience with, with the film. Uh, the director, our director, uh, was very good. He told me exactly what he wanted what he wanted me to say and how to say it and so on. So I followed his directions clearly. And uh, we've had lots of good response from the film itself. We've had lots of lots of people understand it and, and, and promoting it and thanking us for doing it. So it's been a really good experience making that film. And have you seen uh, Planet of the Humans by Michael Moore? Have you seen that documentary yet? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, I've, saw, I've seen that. I saw that recently, sure. I yeah. almost think of your film as kind of the sequel to that because that is really shedding some negatives on renewables and it's really doom and gloom where I found nobody's fuel is more optimistic. It gives us a path forward. It gives us hope for the future, which I think we definitely need. Yeah, yeah. our, our film recognizes the importance of energy to human well-being. Okay. And, and that's something you can't, that's something that keeps getting thrown under the carpet. We need energy and we need lots of it. And that's what's given us that's fossil fuels have solved the main problems 
we have a food, clothing, and shelter. They've solved those problems for us. And I think that's one of the the problems with some of the uh, the environmentalists today. They just think that conservation can solve the problems, but with more than a billion people that don't have access to electricity, how can we possibly deny or ignore those people? They want fuel. They want a good life. They want to be able to study at night. They want tap water. They want all these things that we take for granted and energy ubiquitously is how we get out of poverty. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. We, if we want to want to bring people out of poverty, we've got to give them more energy. There's no question about that. So is there anything else you want to talk about that you wish you had covered in the film or anyone that's listening that uh, you'd like them to know about? No, I think I think that pretty well covers it. I've covered a whole lot of different things here today. And uh, I, I just uh, qu question the science. Question the science. Always question the science. And the science, the science has to make sense. And I always go back to Newton. Newton was one of the most prominent scientists of his day. And he thought that light was a particle. And for, I think it was a hundred years, people just kept believing that light was a particle, even with contrary evidence. And it was only after Maxwell discovered that it was a wave, and it turned out it was a bit of both. But, uh, <laughs> but it's exactly right. The best scientist of the day could be wrong. And it's always good as scientists and engineers to look into things, to question things, to question what's already out there as a norm. So, and and, and as, as engineers, uh, scientists develop science. They develop all the science. Engineers take that science, they understand it, and they apply it to make useful things. So engineers have to understand science. If you, if you don't understand science, you the things you design are going to break. Do you, do you have your engineering ring on as well? I think I saw it. Pardon? Do you have your engineering ring on as well? Your, uh, your pinky ring? Oh, yes, I have my ring, yes. Yes. Uh, show I don't it up have to the a camera, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Show it up to the camera here. Yeah, yeah, okay, there it is. It's stainless yeah. steel. I had a steel one and it corroded away. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I got stainless steel as well. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to answer some questions. I, I thought it was a great film. And uh, thanks so much, Doug Lightfoot. And again, you can find the film on YouTube. It's called Nobody's Fuel. And Doug, thank you so much for uh, for doing this interview. Well, thank you for asking me. I always uh, I always take an, always like an opportunity to talk about my favorite subject. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. I appreciate that.